We continue with our passage and we are now in Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14 and I'm reading from the NAS version so whatever version you have with you you can follow with me through your own Bibles or through the PowerPoint in front. Genesis chapter 14. And it came about in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Eleazar, Kerdarlomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goim, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Birsha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. All these came as allies to the valley of Sidim, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they had served Kedar Lomer, but the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Kedar Lomer and the kings that were with him came and defeated Rephaim in Ashtaroth, Karnaim, and the Zuzim in Ham, and Emim in Shave, Kiriathaim and the Horites in their Mount Seir as far as El Paran, which is led by the wilderness. Then they turned back and came on to Mishfat, that is Kadesh, and conquered all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites who lived in Hazazon, Tamar. And the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zebuim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor, came out. And they arrayed for battle against them in the valley of Sidim, against Kedar Lomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goim, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Eleazar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Sidim was full of tar pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and they fell into them. But those who survived fled to the hill country. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all their food supply, and departed. They also took Lot, Abram's nephew, and his possessions, and departed, for he was living in Sodom. Then a fugitive came and told Abram, the Hebrew. Now he was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshkol, and brother of Aner, and these were allies with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he led out his trained men, born in his house, 318, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them, and pursued them as far as Hoba, which is north of Damascus. He brought back all the goods, and also brought back his relative Lot, with his possessions, and also the women and the people. Then after his return from the defeat of Kedar Lomer, and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shave, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. The king of Sodom said to Abram, give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours, for fear you would say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre, let them take their share. Please be seated. Good morning. For the past two weeks, we had the opportunity to see the various adventures in the life of Abram. We actually saw the progression of Abram's character and likewise the genuineness 
of his faith. And from our passage last week, from what Brother Peter preached, we saw at the end of chapter 13, God giving Abraham a wonderful promise of hope. The hope and promise that God will give back Abraham everything. And included in that promise was the so numerous number of offsprings. This was truly a spiritual victory for Abraham. And most likely, this milestone of promise, this milestone of promise and hope, never left Abraham's heart and never left his thoughts as he faced the various challenges and trials he would be encountering. Now in chapter 14, we see a stronger and more confident Abraham. Abraham knew his God. And we will see through Abraham's actions and reactions to the various circumstances that he would be facing that he really believed and trusted in Almighty God, which is actually a clear evidence that God Almighty was truly at work in his life. We entitled the passage for today, The Battle is the Lord's. The Battle is the Lord's. We divide it in two parts. From verse 1 up to 16, Abraham's victory. And the second part from Genesis 14, 17 up to 24, the reason for Abraham's victory. Before we jump into the passage, may I ask what battle are we going through right now? What battle are we going through right now? Maybe to some it would be a battle of maybe struggles with their health. It could be maybe for some the battle maybe with their finances, the challenges that they face, the trials that they face. And maybe to some there will be challenges or trials that they are facing in terms of relationship in terms of relationship. And you know what? The very passage that we are covering this morning would really address those challenges, those trials. I thought when I was studying this, wow, what shall I see besides the part from where Abraham met Melchizedek? What shall I learn? And truly, by God's grace, I was so amazed with what God revealed through this passage. Let's jump into the first division, Abraham's victory. Brethren, when we go through the first couple of verses in chapter 14, the first part seems to be a little bit overwhelming. Overwhelming all because of the names of places and the names of kings. And really... I thank and praise God for those Bible scholars who there did their diligent research on this. Look at verse 1. And it came about in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elasar, Kedar Laomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goim, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemember, king of Zebuim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. All these came as allies to the valley of Sidim, that is the Salt Sea. Now, just to give us a little background, to be able to appreciate the scene and scenario of the passages we are covering. The setting of this whole scene was during the time when Abraham was living in a country that had been oppressed for 30 years by a great eastern confederacy. And the Great Eastern Confederacy we are mentioning were the names mentioned in verse 1. The four great kings, Amraphel, Ariok, Kidaulamer, and Taidal. Now these four kings which composed the Great Eastern Confederacy had oppressed the land of Cana for 13 long years. 13 long years. And when we reach verse 4, we would find... Twelve years they had served Kedar Lumer, but the thirteenth year they rebelled. Brothers and sisters, for twelve years, these eastern kings demanded from the five Sidim Valley kings, namely Bera of Sodom, 
Birsha of Gomorrah, Shainab of Adma, Shemeber of Zeboim, and King of Bela, a regular tribute year after year. So yung four great eastern kings demanded tribute, taxes from the five kings. Now these five kings occupied a land area that was rich in what? It was very rich in copper. It was very rich in magnesium. It was very rich in asphalt. And it was also very rich in cattle. And scholars say that most likely these were the payments that the people of Cana would have to pay year after year for 12, 13 long years. So what happened was on the 13th year, Sodom and its four allies, the other Sidim Valley kings decided to stop giving payment. That was why, because of this, the four eastern kings saw this as a rebellion. And what the eastern confederacy of kings did was that they banded together in a punitive expedition to discipline the five Sidim Valley kings to drive the point that these four kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zebuim, and Bela still had to pay tribute. Now... Notice closely what else was said. These four kings, the Eastern Confederacy kings, were not going to the area of Sodom in a quiet and peaceful manner. All because the preceding verses say, look at verse 5. And in the 14th year, Kedarlomer, the kings that were with him, came and defeated Rephaim and Ashtaroth Karnaim, and the Zuzim in Ham, and the Emim in Shaveh Kiriathaim, and the Horites in Mount Seir, as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness, then they turned back and came to En Misfat, that is Kadesh, and conquered all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites who lived in Hazazon Tamar. So what do we le learn from these verses? These Eastern Confederacy, which was really, really strong, you know, four kings, they were really strong. And we say that all because the verses that we just read, to prove their strength, they sort of like had a quite number of what? Stopovers before they reached the area of Sidim. Four, several stopovers. Stopovers as if building up their anger and showing off their brute and strength. The verses said that this eastern confederacy swept through all the tribes who were settled on the east of Jordan. And the verse said that they defeated the many ites. Tinalo nila yung sobrang daming ites. The Raphaites, the Zuzites, Emites, Horites, Amalekites, and Amorites. And you know what? For sure, the news and warnings of the victorious march of these eastern kings immediately spread far and wide, which most likely reached the Sidim Valley Kings, which again for sure caused them to be really frightened. From the verses we just read, we saw na sobrang lakas talaga nitong Eastern Confederacy, the four kings led by Kedar Lamer. So these five kings... These five kings who lived in the plain just south of the Dead Sea, what did they do? They decided to put their heads together on how to fight these great conquerors from the east. So the five kings planned. They planned, decided how to fight the four eastern kings. And what they did was this. They planned to draw their enemies into their natural defense. And what was their natural defense? That was to lure them into their great bitumen pits or tar pits. These bitumen pits were actually what? Tar or what we call today as petroleum pits. Tar pits, asphalt pits, petroleum pits. On a side note, if you would look into this in history, this proved that in the area of the Sidim Valley Kings, it was very rich with what? Oil very rich with oil. Brothers and sisters, this area 
in the Valley of Sidim was the place where they mined very explosive inflammable material of tar and oil. And their plan was, their plan was to trap the Eastern Army into these great pits. In ang plano nila. Since kabisado nila yung bitumen pits nila, yung asphalt pits. However, however, things did not turn out as planned. The verses proceed by saying, look at verse 8. And the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zebuim, and the king of Bela, that is Sor, came out. And they arrayed for battle against them in the valley of Sidim. Against Kedarlomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goim, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ario, king of Elazar. Four kings against five. Now the valley of Sidim was full of tar pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and they fell into them. But those who survived fled to the hill country. From verse 10, we see that things started to get out of control. The tides turned. Instead of their plan working against their enemy, it worked against them. All because verse 10 says that when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, the holes they prepared for the enemy were the very holes that some of the, their men fell into. Ano nangyari? Pumalpak yung plano nung five Sidim Valley Kings. So the verse proceeds by saying in verse 11, Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food supply and departed. Now we learn from the verse that this great army that was never defeated at this point seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food, then they went away. Now some of us now might ask, what was Abraham's interest in all the commotion that was going on in this conflict among nations? What was Abraham's interest? And what's the connection between this battle of nations to Abraham? Why all the details? Why did God, through the Holy Spirit, allow all the details be written? We will better understand that as we go through the verses. Look at verse 12. They also took Lot, Abram's nephew, and his possessions and departed, for he was living in Sodom. Brethren, here is the part where the person of Abram enters. In verse 12, it says that these four kings not only carried their goods from Sodom and Gomorrah, but the verse also says that they also carried off Abram's nephew Lot along with everything Lot owned. And why did this happen? We remember from last week that this was the place that Lot chose. Lot was living in that area of Sodom. I don't know if you remember what Brother Peter preached last week. Such a beautiful message. Hindi kita binabolo, Brother Peter. Really, it was so nice, no? And as he was preaching that, I already somehow know what will happen in verse four, chapter 14. We immediately see the consequence from the choice of Lot. We immediately see the consequence. So as this happened, the verse proceeds by saying, look at verse 13. Then a fugitive came and told Abraham the Hebrew. Now he was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eskol. The brother of Aner. And these were allies with Abram. What do we learn from this verse? We see that news of Lot's capture soon reached Abram. So when Abram heard what had happened, what Abram did, what did Abram do? What did Abram do? Did Abram show smugness or pride? Did he say, ayan, ayan, buti nga. Tingnan mo ngayon na pala mo. Yung ba yung sinabi niya? After all, Lot was the one who chose to live in that area. So let him face the consequences of his choice. How about this? Did Abraham keep a safe distance and simply said, well, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. Did he do that? Or did Abraham just shrug his shoulders and say, wow, tough luck. Tough luck. Did Abraham do that? Were these Abraham's reactions... For us to know, let's take a look at the next verse. What does the verse say that Abram did? Look at verse 14. When Abram heard 
that his relative had been taken captive. He led out his trained men, born in his house, 318, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them, and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So basing it from what we just read, we can see that Abraham did the exact opposite of the common reactions that people usually do. He did the exact opposite. From the verse, we see that Abraham immediately called up 318 trained men from his house. So the 318 men from his house, along, along with his allies from Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre. And you would see the allies written in verse 13, and when we reach verse 24. What did they do? They went in pursuit of the captors of Lot as far as Dan. And the verse says that they did this strategically at night. At night. And if you know what? On a side note, Pastor Dennis gave me his preaching on this, which actually centered on the real, on the actual battle that happened. The Bible does not say that Abraham had any military background. No, we don't know. Scripture is silent. But you know what? With the details, and I think you can ask Pastor Dennis, uh, video message or link to this no the battle was really amazing he did it at night strategically and he chased off all his enemies so far i don't know how many kilometers that they had to travel you know what the bible does not say abraham had any military background and yet we can safely say that his leadership courage and tactical planning was really really quite impressive and why do we say this was so? Why was it impressive? Look at verse 15 and 16. He divided his forces against them by night. He and his servants and defeated them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. What happened? He brought back all the goods and also brought back his relative Lot with his possessions and also the women and the people. Truly. Abraham's great power and might to face a powerful conqueror was really, really amazing. Amazing. No wonder that we were given the details in the first verses about what? The four kings. They were really strong. They were strong. Wala nga makatalo sa kanila with the knights. The five sitting valley kings cannot even defeat them. And yet, we see the character of Abram, defeating them. 318 trained men from his household and also from his allies. Now, we don't really know the exact number, but really, what happened here is so amazing. Now, we might ask, how do you think was Abram able to do this? How? We will actually see later how Abram was able to accomplish this as we go through the next verses. But before we go into the next division, may I ask, may I ask, how do you think would we respond if we were in a similar situation that happened to Abram with regards to Lot? How do you think would we respond? Maybe not necessarily an exact one, na parehong pareho yung nangyari kay Abram and Lot na nangyayari sa atin, but make... Maybe we can have a similar situation, like maybe a brother or sister made compromise choices. It could be within our family. It could be within our close friends. And when they made that compromise decision that led them into trouble, what do you think would we do? Or maybe if we are in the same situation right now, what are we doing? Or maybe we went into that situation. What did we do? Would we be like Abraham? Would we be like Abraham that really, despite what happened, yung nangyari sa kanila ni Lot, Abraham still helped out Lot. Would we be like Abraham? Or, or, would we be far from being like him? That we would say and justify, 
Well, that's the consequence for what you just did. Then bala sa buhay mo. What can we pray, brothers and sisters? What can we pray? So that very much like Abraham, that we would be more loving and gracious to others, even if our flesh tells us not to be like so. What can we pray? So that we would be more loving and gracious to others, even if our flesh tells us not to be like so. Heat up, no? This is so hard. This is so hard. I don't know. If I was in the situation of Abraham, I think I won't do what he did. After hearing about the four eastern kings, no. But Abraham did not do that. He even risked his life for his relative lot. Let's now go to the second division. And really, such an amazing division. So kanina, Abraham's victory. Now, the reason for Abraham's victory. Then after his return from the defeat of Kedarlamer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh. That is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God Most High. Brothers and sisters, after Abraham's victory against the powerful Eastern Confederacy, the Shinar kings, after having been successful in recovering Lot in various possessions, we now see from the verses we just read that two kings come out to meet Abraham. And who were these two kings? The verse tells us that these two kings were the king of Sodom and the king of Salem, named Melchizedek. These two kings wanted to meet the man who defeated the unbeatable eastern kings. And you know what? Melchizedek, the king of Salem, was a very mysterious figure. Very mysterious. Some say, some say that Melchizedek was actually the pre-incarnate Christ. Some say. And they would give supporting verses to that. Some scholars also say that Melchizedek was not the pre-incarnate Christ. But they say, but they say that Melchizedek was what? A type of the Lord Jesus Christ. A type. T-Y-P-E. We might ask, what does being a type of the Lord Jesus Christ mean? When we say that Melchizedek was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are saying that Melchizedek was a picture and symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ. In biblical terms, being a type, or what scholars say as typology, is a special kind of symbolism. And you know what? We can actually define a biblical type as a prophetic symbol. And why do we say this was so? All because all types are representations of something yet future. More specifically, a type in scripture is a person or thing in the Old Testament which foreshadows a person or thing in the New Testament. That is why when we say that Melchizedek was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are saying that Melchizedek was a person in the Old Testament who behaves in a way that corresponds to the Lord Jesus' character or actions in the New Testament. And we will actually see truths regarding this as Melchizedek being a type of the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Hebrews and in the book of Psalms, specifically in Psalm 110. Hence, I lean more towards the truth that Melchizedek was not the pre-incarnate Christ, but a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's look into this closely. The title, Melchizedek King of Salem, when you look at the concordance, the name Melchizedek means in the Hebrew as the king of right. You know, ibig sabihin ng Melchizedek, right, king of right. And not just that, the title, the king of Salem, yung kanina Melchizedek, right, king of right. The title king of Salem also meant that Melchizedek was also the what? King of peace. Salem, or in the Hebrew, Shalem, means peace, where we get the word Shalom. Shalom was actually the old name for Jerusalem, which the Jebusites later named as Jerusalem. Now, interestingly, the Lord Jesus Christ actually also holds all these titles. 
The Lord Jesus is also the King of Peace and Righteousness. King of Peace, all because the Lord Jesus sacrifice on the cross has brought us what? Peace with God. Who was also the one who imputed on us the perfect righteousness that can only please God. Hence, we say that Melchizedek was an Old Testament type of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, going back to our passage, what again was said about Melchizedek? And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. From the verses, we learn that Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High God. And again, interestingly, interestingly, in that age of idolatry, during the time, aside from Abraham, we see in this account, Melchizedek exhibited an example of a true monotheistic faith, faithful to acknowledge and worship the one true God. And the verse says that Melchizedek came out of Salem with bread and wine to refresh the war weary men who fought alongside Abraham. And what Melchizedek did was actually what? He publicly blessed Abraham in God's name. Melchizedek duly recognized Abraham's nobility and his faith in the one true God. And you know what? What Melchizedek did? Melchizedek's recognition of Abraham clearly confirms God's favor toward Abraham. And because of that, that must have brought Abraham such great joy. And not just that. Notice what else was said at the end of verse 20. Look at verse 20. Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He gave him a tenth of all. Brothers and sisters, here in this verse lies a very important truth that was clearly emphasized. When we closely observe this, the end of this verse communicates the truth that Abraham recognized Melchizedek's God-given authority being priest of Almighty God. He recognized who Melchizedek was. And we say this all because when Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek, a tenth of everything he had, it was like Abraham was giving it to God. Interesting enough that we also learn from this passage that tithing was an what? Already an ancient custom. And not just that. Here is the most important truth we can get from this act. By this very act of Abraham, this act, Abraham also recognized that the victory that Abraham was able to accomplish came solely from the Lord. The victory came only from the Lord. And that's the answer to the question we posed a while back as to how Abraham won this battle. Abraham won this battle all because of the Lord. Hence the title, The Battle is the Lord's. So, as Melchizedek praised God and blessed Abraham in God's name, and likewise, as Abraham recognized the reason for his victory, evidenced in his act of tight giving to the priest of God Almighty, how do you think did the king of Sodom treat Abraham? Abraham who defeated the eastern confederates and rescued his people and possessions. What did the king of Sodom do? Look at verse 21. The king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. You know what? According to ancient custom during that time, Abraham had every right to the bounty of the conquest. He had every right. He can keep it. In fact, he even had the right to keep the people he rescued and make them his slaves. And yet, notice what Abraham said and did. Look at verse 22. Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread 
or a sandal thong or anything that is yours. For fear you would say, I have made Abraham rich. I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Honor, Eskol, Mamre, let them take their share. Brothers and sisters, we see Abraham from these verses being firm and steadfast with his faith. And we say this all because of what he said. I have sworn to the Lord God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. We see from this verse, Abraham making an oath to Almighty God. Almighty God who owns everything, all of heaven and earth. And what was his oath? That Abraham will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours. He will not take anything. And for what reason did Abraham make this oath? For fear, you would say, I have aid Abraham rich. You know what? If we really think about it, the king of Sodom gave Abraham a very tempting offer. Very tempting. And yet by God's grace, Abraham's heart was not set on earthly rewards. It was not set on earthly rewards. From what Abraham did, we see that Abraham desired true riches that can only come from God. And if I'm not mistaken, Pastor Dennis will discuss this next week. And you know what? This chapter of Abraham's life was truly a testimony of the genuineness of his faith. A genuine faith seen and revealed in his actions and choices. From this chapter, we saw Abraham giving God all the glory when he refused the offer of the king of Sodom. Abraham clearly recognized that it was God who was working alongside him and through him. And you know what? As I was studying these verses, as I was studying this, I was really wondering as to why. As to why this mysterious character of Melchizedek suddenly appeared in this particular account. And not just Melchizedek. I also believe that it was also not by chance, luck, or coincidence that the king of Sodom likewise suddenly entered the scene. And I was really wondering, I was really contemplating why. They are, why? But biglang lumabas si Melchizedek. And, by God's grace, with much prayer and observation of the text, I discovered a very important truth. A very, very important truth. And what was that? Brothers and sisters, when all this happened, we would learn that at the height of our triumphs, at the height of our triumphs would also be the onset and entry of our greatest temptations. Ulitin po. At the height of our triumphs would also be the onset and entry of our greatest temptations. Abraham, in this account, was right in the middle of that very situation. Triumph and temptation. Abraham had all the reason and even the right to draw attention and glory to himself. But by God's sovereign grace, what did God do? God allowed Melchizedek to be there. As a reminder for Abraham as to who Abraham was and who all God Almighty really was. God in his sovereignty allowed Melchizedek to be there. You know what? This is a challenge to us. Oftentimes, at the greatest point of our victory, our triumphs, whether secular, more so spiritual, dyan pumapasok ang greatest temptation sa atin. No wonder, we hear people say, say yung self-made man, di ba? Or people, even in ministry, would draw attention to himself or herself. Nakakatakot. Pero minsan, ang nakakatakot na lalo, biglang iduduktong nila to God be all the glory. But really, the glory is not given to God. This is a reminder for us. Kaya dumating talaga si Melchizedek sa point na yon, To remind Abraham who he is and who is Almighty God. No wonder, ganun talaga yung details ng battle na yon. Why? Because God allowed Abraham allows us today to see that really the battle is all of the Lord's. 
it is the Lord's. And ang temptation palagi sa atin is what? To draw that glory to ourselves. And you know what? When this all happened, in God's sovereignty, God wanted the people of Abraham to know that there was a God who was with Abraham. The people who observed all of this. Specifically who? For me, when I observed it, specifically Lot. Lot. Lot should have observed all of this. He was really saved, not by Abraham alone, but it was really God who saved Lot. Who should have learned? Who should have what? Learned from already the experience. Kaso, we will see in the next few chapters what happened again to Lot. Again, like what we just said a while back, there's really just so much truth that we can learn from this account. To highlight some of those truths, we learn that it was solely through the power and grace of God that Abraham was able to see beyond the faults of Lot. It is only through God's grace that Abraham was able to see beyond the faults of Lot. Abraham saw beyond Lot's shortcomings and because of that, Abraham didn't hesitate to save Lot, even if it meant risking his life. And not just that, here's another truth. We also learn from this account that faith in God is not a passive thing. Why do we say this was so? All because as Abraham trusted and put his faith on God, Abraham at the same time made careful plans, engaged his trained men, and likewise enlist his allies as he battled with the Eastern superpower. Brothers and sisters, careful planning, diligence, and hard work are not in opposition when we put our full trust in God. Careful planning and diligence is actually the act of being faithful with what God has given. As we trust and obey His will without any compromises. So, how can all these truths be helpful or applicable to us? How can it be helpful? How can we practicalize it? Sabi nga nila. Not to over-spiritualize our study. If we really think about it, Abraham's battle is also very much like a Christian's battle with our unseen spiritual enemies. As Abraham was up against a great world power, the Christian life, likewise, on the other hand, is always filled with spiritual battles. Would you agree? We are always in a warfare with Satan. Satan as its head together with his minions. Now, since we are always in a spiritual battle, what did the Apostle Paul say? In the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 6, verse 10 up to 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Brothers and sisters, the Apostle Paul commands in his letter to the Ephesians that we are to put on the full armor of God. And what are those? Breast, belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness, shoes of the gospel of peace, shield of faith, helmet of salvation, sword of the Spirit. Clearly from the Ephesians passage, the Apostle Paul commands that the full armor of God is that we are to what? We are to wear it and we are to use it. Now may I ask, may I ask, if we say that we are a true Christian, okay, for sure, it's either we were just in a spiritual battle, or maybe we are in a current battle, or we will soon be in one. Now because of that, may I ask, may I ask, when we are in a spiritual battle, what do we do? What do we do? In what way do we choose to use our ways rather than God's way to fight evil? In what way? Because it's dangerous for Christians. We think sometimes we are the ones who is almighty. We think that we are the ones sovereign. But you know what? Clearly, from what the Apostle Paul said in the book of Ephesians, what? God has given us the armor 
in God given us has given us the weapon that is God's word that is God's word means ang kasi we try to solve our problems or our battles through our own flesh through our own effort we move away from God's word we move away from the church but you know what kaya niligay ni God yan jaan eh that is why the church is there to really what God uses that to help us to encourage us what do we do how diligent or not diligent are we in using the spiritual armor and weapon that God has given how diligent or not diligent are we in using the spiritual armor and weapon that God has given do we neglect the very resource that God has given us God's Word how faithful are we in really studying it how faithful are we in really trying to understand it in really trying to live it how about this when we by God's grace triumphantly got through the battle who gets the glory who gets the glory is it us or is it God now if we say it is God how is this evidenced in our lives how is this seen or evidenced in our lives what do we mean with the way we relate with others with the way we respond to others challenges Minsan kasi ang delikado, di ba? Pagka, by God's grace, you think you are strong, you think you have won the battle. Pag merong iba, ang sasabihin mo, bakit ikaw hindi mo naintindihan? Ba't ako naintindihan ko? Ba't nagagawa ko? Wow, that is so dangerous. That is so dangerous. I heard the other day, someone sharing to me, I tried to go share the gospel to a person, and kahit anong gawin ko, hindi niya maintindihan. Bakit ako naiintindihan ko? Wow. That is so dangerous. That is why, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, what can we pray? What can we pray that as we engage in our spiritual battles, what can we pray? That we will really always rely only on the Lord. Brothers and sisters, God was truly the one behind Abraham's victory. Not only in the battle when he faced the kings, but really the battle was also what? Inside the heart of Abraham. You know, the unseen battle running in the mind, in the heart of Abraham. And you know what? Here's an encouragement to us God knows exactly what we are going through. God knows exactly what we are going through. Better than how we know it. Sometimes kasi, di ba, sabi nga ni Brother Peter last week, sorry, ah, ano, sabi niya, ano yung kanta? Uh, Dati-rati, no? Ito, dagdag, natutulog ba ang Diyos? Do you say that? Diba, Lord, why? Why? By God's grace, Lord, di ba, parang, I'm trying to be faithful. Not perfect, di ba? But you know what, Lord, I cannot already bear what is going on in my life. And sometimes you just want to give up. Kung baga sa boxing, you just want to throw the, the towel. You know what? Brothers and sisters, God knows exactly the battles we are going through. And you know what? He is faithful. Faithful to give us strength. Faithful to give us wisdom. And faithful to give us the courage as we face those battles. Let's spend a minute or two to really just reflect on the passage that we just received. Let's pray. Father God, again, we just come before you. Truly, we praise you for you're so gracious despite us. You're so faithful to us, O oh Lord. Again, thank you so much for how you sustain us. Thank you so much for the truths that would only come from your word. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
And this we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Have a blessed Sunday.